Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you will rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before this occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day, so that my words are your words, and we have the courage to put your words into practice now and always. Amen. The light turned yellow just in front of him, and he now had to make one of those quick decisions, one that every licensed driver faces. Should he stop or should he keep going? He did the right thing. Stopping at the crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman was furious. She honked her horn. She screamed in frustration. She missed her chance to get through the intersection. And the driver's ignorant, rude actions caused her to spill her coffee, drop her cell phone, and smear the makeup she was applying. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officers ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. He put her in handcuffs and took her to the police station. Once there, she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a cell. After a couple of hours, the lady was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting for her with her possessions. He said, I am so sorry for this mistake. I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and screaming and mad. You were giving the guy in front of you some kind of sign language that I didn't <laughs> understand. And while I was observing your behavior, I was standing behind the car, so I noticed on the back of the car you had the following bumper stickers. What would Jesus do? Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Follow me to Sunday school and honk if you love Jesus. Naturally, with what was displayed on your car and what I witnessed in your behavior, I assumed that the car was stolen. <laughs> it is hard to live as Christians in today's world. Many people have opinions, strong opinions, on what the Christian person should be doing, and they are quick to point out all of our shortcomings. It would be so much e easier if we as Christians could love God and live life in any manner that we saw fit. But that's not, we are, that's not what we are called to do. God calls us to live by his standards, and sometimes that is different from the standards of the world. Accepting and living out that privilege is, well, it's, it's complicated. So I ask, is it hard to live as a Christian? For the most part, we live by the same rules and the same standards as the average person. We try and make apt decisions. We have the responsibility of providing for our families, being good citizens, respecting the planet, handling tragedies and challenges with dignity, and we strive to make this world a better place. But as Christians, we need to take our living one step further. We also must know that anyone in need is our neighbor, and we should be helping them. 
we are told to follow the Ten Commandments, to live by the golden rule, to forgive so that we will be forgiven, to love the Lord with all our heart and our minds and our soul. We have to love our neighbors of ourselves. We have to remember that what we do to others, we do to Christ. And what we don't do for others, we don't do for Christ. And we are to make God the fixed center of our lives. God requires us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So is it hard to be a Christian? Yes, it certainly is. But would we ever want to stop doing so? No. We need to see our Christianity as our calling, as an honor, and as a joy to serve God in this world. Anyone can, can live, anyone can exist, but to do so by fulfilling God's purpose, that is a hard and a wonderful privilege. And this privilege is enhanced by what God gives to us. In Scripture, Jesus is imparting certain truths to his disciples. In these words, he's giving to us certain gifts that can help us live as children of God. The first thing we are given is the Holy Spirit. Now in his book, What Do You Mean?, Seth Parker says the following, the primary thing about the Holy Spirit is that it lives here with us and in us to purify and empower us. Sometimes the Spirit gives us silent messages in such a startling and stern way that we are motivated. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the Comforter, which is a Latin word that means strength. The Spirit is also known as the Advocate, one who gives guidance, instruction, and help, one who teaches us new applications of old truth and brings forth new concepts of an old truth. God gives to us the Holy Spirit, the persona of God that lives with us and in us. The Holy Spirit is the part of the Trinity that protects us, guides us, motivates us, presides us with strength, offers us help. The Holy Spirit teaches us, imparts on us memories and actions of Christ, and serves as that still, small voice that gives us a nudge when we need it to do so. The gift of God's Spirit is God in and with us. The gift of God's Spirit reminds us that God is as close to us as we ever need God to be. The gift of God's Spirit is priceless. Now the second gift that God gives us so that we can do this difficult task of living in the world as Christians is God gives us the peace of Christ. Jesus makes a very clear distinction between his peace and the peace that the world gives us. By the standards of the world, what is peace? Peace is a state without war. It is freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Peace is a state of freedom from storm or disturb disturbance and peaceful coexistence. When we think of peace, we think of calmness, serenity, quietness. But when we think of the peace that Jesus gives, it is much, much more than the absence of conflict. It is a peace that gives a promise. It is a confidence that cannot be broken. The peace of Christ is an invitation to live and serve and pray as Jesus did. The peace of Christ means that Christ in our lives, we really don't need to worry or fear or stress. And this peace does not come and go. It does not waver in its effectiveness, and it does not get weaker with age. The peace of Christ is special because it is Christ's to give meaning that it is given by the one who lived as we live. It is given by one who was tempted as we are tempted, one who faced what we faced, and one that endured as we must endure. The peace of Christ comes from one who knows firsthand what it's like to be a human. And this peace also comes from someone who knows firsthand what it is like to be God, one who knows how to serve God, how to be obedient to God, how to live as God intended, and how to make God proud. 
Who better to give us that kind of peace than the Son of God? And the final thing that Christ gives us in these words is an assurance. He tells us that he is going to the Father. In Christ we have that assurance that one day through him we too will go to the Father in heaven. The love that God has for us is special, it's powerful, it's for all of us. And when we believe we are given that gift of eternal life. Which means we too one day will go to the Father. And as Jesus says that is a happy event. Nothing could stop Jesus from going to the Father. Not those who followed him, not those who killed him, not even the ruler of this world. And that is because that God so loved the world that anyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have that life eternal. So once upon a time there was, I'm going to try it this way because the poet blocks this whole side, so I'm going to try that. I'm, I'm actually on the tile, so I'm in the sanctuary, which means nothing. I just thought I'd say it. <laughs> so, once upon a time, there was a young man who was in college, and he was studying, and he was doing the things that you do in college. I'm not going to give you examples from my life. <laughs> That's a secret. Uh, but he was doing what you do, and he wasn't happy. He wasn't satisfied. He, he didn't like the college experience. His grades weren't where they should be. He, his social life wasn't what he expected. And, and he, wasn't having, he wasn't having a good time. And on top of that, the, the more that he disliked his college experience, the more frustrated and, and angry and, and sad and depressed that he became. And he really was in quite a terrible state. He was, <coughs> excuse me, he was so low and so depressed that he could do the only thing that he could think of, so he went to the dimly lit and seldom used chapel on the college campus. And he goes into this chapel and what he notices is that the chapel is adorned with, with praise, with worship, with things that show people's love and appreciation to God. And when he saw the chapel, when he saw everything that God was and gives, he became very angry at where his life was. And so he started a rant against God right there in the chapel. He, he cried, he screamed, he yelled. He probably kicked a temper tantrum as far as what that looks like when you're an adult. And, and he got out his feelings against all his frustrations. He said, God, you created this world. What were you thinking? It's a mess. There is not love. The world is full of selfishness. The world is full of pain and despair and people not happy and people not able to do things. And they're certainly not showing your love for you. And people are miserable. And they're suffering and because of all of this when anything bad happens they say how could a good and loving God let this happen and so they go away from you and they move away from you and they don't understand and this world is in a terrible state and he said God I could do a much better job than you have I could create a world I could make this world a better place and right when he said that sentence, there was a voice that filled the chapel and it said, my child, that's, what, that's exactly what I want you to be doing. God calls us to make this world a better place. It's hard. It's hard to live as a Christian, but it's something God wants us to do. And God gives us all the tools. We have that Holy Spirit within us. We have that presence of Christ to guide us. We have that assurance of Jesus that we can do this, that we can make the world a better place. This morning at the 1030 worship service, we are going to celebrate. We are going to embrace six young people who have decided to make a commitment to be members of this church. Not just joining this church, six young people who have spent two years studying and preparing and doing mission work and learning to understand what God is all about. 
when young people their age are out doing whatever it is they do and making choices that affect them and only them, these six young people have decided to stand here and commit their lives to Christ. So let's let them be our story today. Let's let them be our example today of how we can live, the fact that we can do it, and let's let them, by their commitment, show us that we can make this world a better place. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to do your work as hard as challenging, as daunting as that is, be with us as we try to make this world a better place, now and always. Amen.